talk about choosability of toroidal graphs with forbidden structures. But before that, I'll talk about some history. And in order to talk about some history, I'll introduce some notation and some definitions. So I'll start off with what, a, what an Euler genus of a surface is. And in order to introduce that, I'll talk about what a surface is. So a surface is a compact two-manifold without boundary. And this is a discrete math talk. And I don't have a st strong background in topology, so Let's ignore that. And I'll just define a surface in terms of two operations. And I'll just take that as a definition because it's somewhat equivalent. So a surface is an object obtained uh, by two operations on the sphere, two operations. on the sphere. And the sphere is, you know, a sphere. By applying. So the first operation is adding a handle. So what's the handle? Uh, nobody has a coffee mug. Oh, there's a coffee mug. Right? So it's just you have some mm -hmm. surface. And you add some handle, and it becomes a surface with a handle, like this. So how is this different from the plane? This is different from the plane in the sense that you can allow some edges crossing, except they're not actually crossing because you're using this handle. And the second operation is adding a cross cap. So this is just you have a sphere, you have some surface, and you have something that looks like this, and it becomes like this. Okay. So what this circle with an x inside means is you have these <coughs> antipodal points, right? Points on the opposite side, and you identify them. So if you have an edge, if you have a vertex, and if there's an edge from here that goes inside here, you will just magic cross over this hole and come like this. And the same here, if you were here, then it comes like this. Right? So this is some other, it's like a black hole, right? You're jumping over this space and you allow some type of crossing that was originally not allowed on the plane. So I'll just take this as a definition. So the surface is an object obtained by adding some number of handles and some number of cross caps to the sphere. And there are two types of surfaces, right? The first type is orientable surfaces. So what's an orientable surface? It's just you add handles to your sphere. Right? So What's the minimum number of things you can add to a surface? It's zero, right? So your surface itself is orientable, right? What does it mean to be orientable? It means there's a clear inside and an outside. So once you're inside the sphere, you can't go to the outside of the sphere without crossing this boundary. And you also have your torus, right? This is just, you have your sphere and you add one handle. And then you homeomorphically deform it, and then you get your mug, your coffee mug, or your donut. And you can add one more, and you get a double torus. And you can imagine you add more and more handles. Right? The other type of surfaces is your non-orientable surface. This is you obtain by adding cross caps to your sphere. 
So what does it mean to be non-orientable? It means there's no up and down, right? There's no inside and outside. Once you're in the projective plane, you're in the projective plane, right? You can walk on top of it and you can also walk on the other side of it. So you have your sphere and you add one cross cap, right? This is also known as the real projective plane. And you can also add one more cross cap. And now you have the climb bottle. And you know, you can add three cross caps. And I don't think this has a special name, and you can keep going, so on and so forth. Right. So the question is, I said there's only two types of surfaces, an orientable type and a non-orientable type. But I also said, by definition, a surface is an object by adding some number of cross caps and some number of uh, handles. So what happens if you add one handle and one cross cap? Is it orientable or non-orientable? Right? If you have one cross cap, it's going to be non-orientable. So there has to be some equivalences between these operations. right? So if I go over here. And erase this. So the neat thing is three cross caps is equivalent to a cross cap and a handle. Right? So once you have a cross cap on your object, on your surface, you can use that cross cap to transform all of your handles into two additional cross caps. And you just keep changing all your handles into two cross caps and you end up in this case. Right, which says you're just adding cross caps onto the sphere. And if you don't have any cross caps, then you're an orientable surface because you don't have any cross caps, you have just some number of handles on your sphere. Right? So one or maybe two years ago when I first saw this, I said, okay, so three cross caps equal one cross cap and a handle. So the dumb graduate student goes ahead and does this. Right? Because, you know, you can just cancel the cross caps. <coughs> and obviously this is not true, because if this were to be true, then your torus and your climb bottle would be the same. Right? You have a s the torus, you obtain a torus by adding one handle, and you obtain the climb bottle by adding two cross caps. But obviously they're not the same, because this one is orientable and this one is non-orientable. Right? So everything I've just said in the past 10 minutes is more or less summarizing this theorem in topology that's called classification of surfaces, right? And there, they actually define, you know, these home homeomorphisms and handles and half handles and they do something more, right? So this is true, but this is not true. But what I want to talk about today is graphs embeddable on these surfaces. So instead of saying, oh, I want to talk about orientable surfaces with three, cross, three handles and non-orientable surfaces with four cross caps, I'll just assign some number for each surface. And that will be called the <coughs> Euler genus. So the Euler genus of a surface just equals the number of handles times 2 plus the number of cross caps. And this somewhat makes sense, right? Because one handle equals two cross caps. So if you plug in one handle times two, that's the same as having no handles and two cross caps. Okay. So your sphere has Euler genus 0. And your torus has Euler genus 2, your double torus has Euler genus 4, projective plane has 1, climb bell has 2, and this thingy here has 3. Right. So even though these two objects, the torus and the climb bell, have Euler genus 2, they're not the same object. It's just some function you assign to a surface to the positive integers. Right. 
Any questions? Does this make sense? Okay. So on to the slides. Right. So, yeah. so now we all know what a torus is. So we should all know what a toroidal graph is. It's just a graph embeddable on the torus with no edge crossings. So I'll talk about choosability. So if you give me a graph, I'll let L be just some list assignment. This means for each vertex, I give some set of colors that's available for that vertex. And then I'll say an L coloring is just a function where you choose one color for each vertex where this color comes from the list of available colors. And I want to make sure that each edge has different endpoints, right? They have different, differently colored endpoints. So a graph is going to be k-choosable if there's an L, L coloring for each L where every vertex has at least L, uh, k colors. Right? So this just means that if I give every vertex k colors, and I don't care what these k colors are, if I can always pick a coloring, a proper coloring from these lists, or from the, from the lists, then it's going to be k-choosable. And the minimum k is going to be the choosability. And the graph is going to be k-colorable if all the lists have the same set of colors. So the chromatic number is going to be the minimum such k, so naturally, the chromatic number problem is going to be a special case of your choosability problem. So the graph on the left is k24, and it's bipartite, so it's too colorable. But this graph, if I give it this list assignment, then it's not too choosable, right? Because for every combination on the left and the right, so <coughs> red and blue on the left and green and orange on the right, for every combination, there's some vertex in the middle that has that combination. So that vertex will not be able to be properly colored. So this shows that the chromatic number and the list chromatic number can be different. And of course, you can generalize this example to say the list chromatic number and the chromatic number can be arbitrarily, the difference can be arbitrarily large. Right? So this is a too colorable graph that's not too choosable. And I'll briefly mention an open problem about this at the very end. So this is choosability. So Thomason in 1994 solved a conjecture by Erdős by saying he proved that all planar graphs are five choosable. And then Voigt proved that, well, she constructed a graph that's not four choosable. So we know that this number is sharp. Right? <coughs> So the natural question is, when are planar graphs four choosable? So these people prove that if you give me a planar graph and if you forbid one type of cycle where that type is either 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7, then the choosability of the graph drops from 5 to 4. So the theme here is you're forbidding something very small, right? somewhat something that's bothering you from being uh, five choosable. And we have all these results that show if you want to decrease the choosability from 5 to 4 to 3, then, then you have to forbid all of these cycles, right? The first one is actually a lie, right? Because the first one actually says that planar bipartite graphs are 3 choosable. So not only 3, 5, 7, or 9, but 11, 13, 15, 17, right? You have to forbid all of these infinitely many odd cycles then you have to be three choosable. But of course, I can't make an infinitely long table. So the second result is a result by Thomason. So when he proved that all planar graphs are five choosable, he proved something else, right? He also proved that if you give me a planar graph with girth five, then it becomes three choosable. So if you forbid cycles, the two smallest cycles, <coughs> then the choosability drops from five to four, I mean five to three. And then people said, OK, maybe we want to allow four cycles and keep on forbidding these triangles. Then there are all these results that say, if you forbid 3, 5, 6, then you're 3 choosable, 3, 8, 9, 3 choosable, and you keep going down the list. Right? Actually, this result by uh, Zdenek, Bernard, and Ruste 
it's a generalization of Thomason's result. Right? Thomason's result says if you forbid three cycles and four cycles, then you become three choosable. But their result actually says you don't need to forbid all of the three cycles and four cycles. You just forbid certain types of three cycles and four cycles that are close to each other. Then you are three choosable. And there's a corollary they get three, six, seven is also three choosable. So all of these results are about, well, you give me a planar graph and you forbid three cycles. But what if you want to allow four, three cycles, right? So Borodin proved that if you allow three cycles, then you have to forbid cycles from length four all the way up to nine. Then the graph becomes three choosable. And some subset of these people saw this result and then they said, okay, maybe we don't want to forbid all of these cycles, right? Maybe we just want to forbid four, five, six, and nine. What, what happens to the choosability? So these people, there are six results that say if you forbid four cycles and nine cycles and any two cycles between lengths five and eight, then, be then the graph becomes three choosable. But the main question or one question in this direction is, what if you don't what if you want to allow nine cycles, right? What if what happens when you forbid cycles from only length four to eight? Right? So in this paper paper of Borodin, he asks this question. He says, okay, maybe you want to allow three cycles, but you want to forbid four to nine. Then we know it's three choosable. What happens if you allow three cycles and if you forbid four to eight? Is it still three choosable? Okay. I don't understand the first entry on that table. So this is actually a lie, because yet it says, well, by a lie, I mean the result says it's planar bipartite, then it's three choosable. So I need to have infinitely many x's. Right? Planar and bipartite. Does it work with the graphs? These are all planar graphs. So planar and you forbid these cycles, right? Here. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Did you have or algorithmic or uh, I know that allotarsis is not like, oh. is like polynomial method, but what about the others? Uh, Thomason is induction, right? You have a vertex, you uh -huh. take it away, you find some nice coloring, and then you extend it. Uh, these three results are discharging and this one the one that generalizes Thomason result is the same as Thomason's proof well the technique is the same so it's just some clever induction and the one by Boro sorry doesn't this suggest that there should be some result that for any integer n there's a list finite list of numbers greater than n such that if you fit those cycles then you get three choosability in a planar graph. Yes. So first, yeah. I see all of them have, you forbid triangles, but then you have this exceptional result that says, okay, you can allow triangles, mm -hmm. but then you have to allow, disallow yes. four to nine. Uh -huh. But what if you say, you, I mean, you, you want this list, which is four to nine in that case. Right. You want to say, for any integer n, there's some list mm. greater, with all integers greater than n such as you forbid this. I mean, that list could be ridiculously large, mm -hmm. right? But right. maybe for every n there exists such a list that would drop this down. That is not true. So you take the minimum counter example, which is a uh, minimum example with, I mean, which is not three choosable. That, I mean, assume that it has 100 vertices. Mm -hmm. And if you forbid everything above 100, I mean, mm -hmm. you still have that counter mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's there's a open question about the alone Tarsi result, right? This one says you have to forbid all odd cycles. So the question is, I mean, that's kind of ridiculous, right? You have to forbid all odd cycles to become three choosable. Maybe you can allow some of these odd cycles, right? So where's the, where's the threshold when you only look at odd cycles and if you want to forbid some finite number of them? Maybe not all of them, right? So. More questions? Yes. 
Okay, so there's all this history about uh, having, if you're given a planar graph and you want to forbid some cycles, how the, how the choosability drops. Right? And because I talked about surfaces, the next question or another direction of research is what about graphs on the torus or some general G, right? So I'm going to define, so this definition actually holds for when your genus is zero, but the results don't. So I'll just, by definition, take the genus to be positive. Right? So I'll let g to be some positive integer and pi of g to be some surface of Euler genus g. And I'll just let h of g be the Haywood number of, which is just a function of g. So the Haywood number is the Hewood number, but I was corrected when I said Haywood. When I said Hewood, I was corrected. Apparently, it's Haywood. So, <laughs> so. okay. So in 19, uh, 1890, so more than 120 years ago, <coughs> Haywood proved that if you give me a graph on some surface, then the maximum chromatic number is this function here, h of g. And he conjectured that this result is tight. He said if you give me some graph on some surface, then there exists a graph where equality holds. And this is somewhat surprising because if you put g equals 0, then this number boils down to 4. So Haywood's conjecture is true for, so the form is true for the plane, except his proof doesn't extend to the plane case. And we all know that planar graphs are four colorable, and that was proved in 1970, 1974 or something. So it took another 80 years after this result to prove that. <coughs> so Haywood conjectured that this is true, but in 1930, 1930, Franklin proved that Haywood was wrong, right? that this conjecture is not true. Because if you look at the Klein bottle, then the maximum chromatic number is not the Haywood number, but the Haywood number minus one. But then maybe the Klein bottle is the only case where this conjecture is false. So there's some series of results by various people. So the first one is in 1954. Ringel proved that Haywood's conjecture is true for infinitely many cases. And then there's a whole series of results that say, OK, uh, in this case is true, in that other case is true, this other case is true. So all these results show that Haywood's conjecture is true when the genus is some number mod 12. And then in 1968, Ringel and Young's completed the entire proof. So because I didn't want to cite all of these people, I just cite it like this. So Haywood's con this theorem says that Haywood's conjecture is true, except for the Klein bottle. So what do we know? We know what we know so far is called Dirac's map color theorem. So what this theorem says is if you give me a graph on some surface, then the maximum chromatic number is Haywood's number, which was proven by Haywood in 1890. And not only that, it says it's tight if and only if you have the complete graph as a subgraph. And this part is still true, even though it, the conjecture itself is false, because it's if and only if. So if you have the complete graph on h of g vertices, it's trivial that your chromatic number is h of g. So what did Dirac actually prove? He just proved this direction. right? He proved that if your graph on this surface has h of g, if the chromatic number is h of g, then you contain a complete graph. And this map color theorem is not only true, it's even truer, I guess? Right? <laughs> because it's not, tr it's not only true for the chromatic number, it's true for the list chromatic number as well. Right? So if you give me a graph, then the same number, right, the same bound holds, for the list chromatic number, because I took this definition to be only when g is positive, right? Because when g is zero, you're talking about the sphere, and we know that planar graphs 
the maximum choosability of planar graphs do not equal the maximum choosability of the maximum chromatic number of planar graphs, right? So there's a gap for the sphere, but for every other case, there's no gap, right? which is somewhat surprising, right? Because when I first look, looked at this, I said, okay, if you have more handles and more cross gaps, of course, as the genus gets higher, it must be harder, right? Because you have more things attached to your surface. But including, the, including these results, most results in this area say that intuition is actually not true. Most of the time, it's harder for lower genu genus surfaces. And if you go beyond like 10 or 20, everything just follows nicely by some formula because of this mathematical tool called induction. Right? So if you just take care of some finite number of base cases, then if you apply induction, most of these <coughs> coloring results generalize. <coughs> yes? For arbitrary G, is there, uh, does there exist a surface that is in, uh, the graph G is embeddable? Yes. So you give me a graph? This graph is fixed, yeah. and then for each edge, I just give a handle. Okay. Uh, then it doesn't matter. Well, you have to use a lot of handles, but it's still some finite surface, right? So this list coloring is like the last one says that whenever list chromatic number is equal to h of g, then you don't really care whether g is embeddable or not on this. Surface, but oh, no, no, you have to be embeddable on this surface. The previous one didn't say that. Oh, yeah, sorry. So G, G is always embeddable on uh, okay. pi of G. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, and the same thing theme comes up here, right? The reason you have two, the reason I cited two results is that the first one, they proved it for almost all surfaces. I think they proved it for everything except this. Everything except the non-orientable surface with three cross caps. And then Kral and Krakowski proved it for this special case, right? Yeah. And so that's very interesting, uh, at least for me. So what about the torus, right? We have all these results. We have all these results for the plane, and then we have all these results for higher genus surfaces. So now if you go on to the torus, then these people, right, this result, if you plug in two to this number, right, you get seven. So this result says if you give me a graph embeddable on a torus, then the choosability is at most seven, and it's sharp if and only if you contain a K7, the complete graph on seven vertices. And you can think of the same type of extensions, right? What happens if you forbid these small <coughs> cycles? So forbidding a cycle of length eight is meaningless because you still have this K7. And the K7 means your choosability is 7. So the choosability does not drop down. So in 2010, uh, Kai Wang and Zhu, they proved that if you're a graph on a torus, and if you forbid some small cycle, right, maybe a 3 cycle, then your choosability drops from 7 all the way down to 4. And if you forbid a 4 cycle, it drops to 4. If you forbid a 5 cycle, it still drops down to 4. And they proved if you forbid a six cycle, this is what I'll talk about in the next 20, 30 minutes. If you forbid a six cycle, then your choosability drops down from seven to six, I mean seven to five, and not four. Why? Because you have the complete graph on five vertices. Right? The complete graph on five vertices does not contain a C6, but the choosability is still five, so this result is sharp. And this top result, the first part is trivial because if you forbid a C7, then you forbid a K7. So the choosability drops down from seven to six. But this is the interesting part. They proved that the same type of result holds if you forbid seven cycles, right? The choosability is six if and only if you contain this six, uh, complete graph on six vertices. And then there's some space here, so they conjectured that the same thing should be true for graphs without, for graphs on a torus without six cycles. 
Right, so they conjectured that they wanted to say blah, 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 and the choosability is five if and only if your graph contains a complete graph on five vertices. So the only thing you have to prove is say if your graph is not embeddable on a torus, and if you don't contain a six cycle, this condition, and also you don't contain a K5, then the choosability drops down from five to four. <coughs> So they had this conjecture, and this conjecture is false, right? because I can do this. So this is a torus, right? and so this graph is embeddable on a torus, and this graph does not contain six cycles, because if you use this edge that jumps from here to here, then you have to pass through too many vertices. And if you don't use this edge, then each block is too small to contain a six cycle. And why is this graph not four choosable? Because it's not four colorable. Right? Because if I color this with one, this vertex on the left with one, then these three vertices is a triangle. So I have to use two, three, four, which means this vertex is also should be colored with one. Then this is also a triangle, so two, three, four. So one, 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 and you have this edge. So this graph is not four colorable. But another interesting part is this graph is embeddable on almost all surfaces. Right? Every surface except the plane and the projective plane. Right? Because if these if these two, if this part and this part have the same arrow, and what is this, this side also have the same arrow, then you're on the torus. So the torus beyond, right? You can embed it on everything from the torus to double torus to triple torus and so on. But you can also flip the edge on the other side, right? which means it's embeddable on the Klein bottle. And you can embed it on every surface with more, with at least two cross caps. So the only exception is for the, the plane and the projective plane. Okay. So you have two things you don't know. So when you're a graduate student, you solve some conjecture, or you disprove some conjecture, you do two things, right? The first thing is you show it to your advisor and you brag about it. The second thing is you send it to the paper you found the conjecture, right? And these two people gave me different questions, right? So Sasha Kostochka, my advisor, he said, OK, so you proved that this statement is false, except maybe for the projective plane, right? Because for the plane, we already know that if you don't contain a C6, then it's four choosable. So he said, okay, what happens on the projective plane? Right? He wants to know if this statement is true. And then I send the result to shooting Jew, and then he replies saying, okay, good job. What about instead of forbidding K5, you see here a lot of K5 minus one edge. Right, with, so this is K5, except you're missing this edge here. So he said, okay, let's not leave the torus. You're still on the torus, and you still want to forbid C6, the cycle on six vertices. What if you forbid something slightly less, or slightly more, right? You forbid something slightly more, so you're looking at a slightly smaller class of graphs. And of course, you have two questions, and you only solve one of them, and the one you solve is not the one from your advisor. Right? So I solved the, the second statement. So what the statement says is if you're a graph on a torus and you don't have a six cycle, and if you forbid something that looks like this, right, namely your K5 minus one edge, then your choosability drops down from seven to four. I mean, you already knew it dropped down from seven to six, because if you don't contain a six cycle, then it drops down to six, or it drops down to five, right? Because if you don't contain a six cycle, it drops down to five. But if I forbid one more, then it drops down to four. And this result is sharp in some sense, because if I forbid C6 and allow K5 minus an edge, I have this graph. And if I allow K5 minus, if I forbid K5, what? Let's see. If I forbid C6 and allow K5 minus an edge, you have this. If I have 
If I forbid k5 minus an edge, and if I allow c6, then I have this graph. Right. Right. And this graph is also not four colorable because this is a complete graph on four vertices because this edge comes down here, comes back here, so one, two, three, four, and then the same thing, one, two, three, four, and this vertex is adjacent to these two and these two. Yeah. And this graph is also embeddable on every surface except the plane and the projective plane because you can also play with the endpoints of this surface. Mm. Any questions? Mm -hmm. But k5 minus an edge itself is four choosable, right? So yes. In in that sense, it's not really tight, you know. In a uh, it could be tighter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So ideas of the proof. Uh, of course, uh, the proof uses discharging, <laughs> but there's a lot of difficulties <coughs> of discharging because you usually start off with this, right? You assign charge this much to the vertices, you assign charge this much, to the fa this much to the faces, and then your initial sum is at most zero this time, right? It's not negative. Because if usually when you do discharging on planar graphs, it becomes negative, and at the very end, all you have to do is say there exists, oh, at the very end, you just have to say the final charge is positive locally. Right? So if you sum up the final charge at the very end, it's going to be non-negative. Therefore, you have some contradiction. But here, the charge can be, the, the sum of the initial charges can be non-negative. So you have to find somewhere in your graph that has positive charge which is one extra step, but it's still kind of annoying. The second thing is all of these reducible configurations, right? Because if you give me a graph on the plane, and if you forbid six cycles, then you can't have four, four cycles adjacent to each other. But on the torus, that's possible because you have this handle. And all these edges can cross over this handle, and you can get all these weird shapes that don't appear in planar graphs. And yeah, so that's what I was talking about. And difficulty with forbidding six cycles is where I got really annoyed because I looked up all these papers, and even papers in J JCTB seem to be incorrect when you forbid six cycles. Because they say, OK, you don't have a six cycle. So you don't have a six face, which is false. And they say, if you don't have a six cycle, you don't have two four cycles sharing an edge, which is intuitively it makes sense. Because if you have two four cycles, right, then this becomes a six cycle. But then some of these vertices can be the same. right? So for the papers that say you don't have a six face, I can give you this face. right? Because this is one, two, three, four, five, six. Right? And for papers that say no two four faces sharing an edge, I can say one, two, three, four. This is one four face. And this is also a four face. Right. So some of these papers can be salvaged, right? Because they can say, OK, if you have a six face, then this vertex must be a cut vertex, because there, there must be something inside and outside. Maybe you can jiggle around and do something else. And they can also do something with this, because you say, OK, you have a four face here, four face here. Then you must have this triangle that separates the outer part from the inner part. But that's definitely not true for the torus, right? Because if you have a torus, then you might have a handle that goes from inside to outside. And then things get messy. Okay. And this is all I'll say about the proof, because the proof is not pretty at all. Uh, yeah. Questions? Okay, so open problems. Uh, the first one is the question about that qu the question that Borrow didn't raised: Are planar graphs without cycles of length four to eight three choosable? This one, I don't know if people didn't try or nobody knows about this question because this paper itself doesn't prove that planar graphs without well, I mean, he proves it, but he proves something much stronger. He says, if you're a graph on a plane, then you must contain either this, 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 or this. And then as a corollary, you get 
then it's too degenerate, so you get three choosability. So maybe, and the paper is only like a page and a half. <laughs> so maybe you can do something more, right? Because you, after all, you're just allowing nine cycles, right? The second question is what I was talking about in the very beginning, right? In the very beginning, I said I gave you K24, and I said this is a two colorable graph that's not too choosable. And we know these examples for 2, 3, and 4, right? We know that there exists a four colorable planar graph, which means it's just a planar graph. That's not four choosable. Okay. But now, what if we extend the, the pool of graphs to graphs on a torus, right? We know that six colorable toroidal graphs are always six choosable. Why? Because if a graph on a torus is six colorable, that means you don't have a K7, which means by the result down here, the maximum is always the same, so it's going to be six choosable. So the question is what happens for five, right? Is there a graph on a torus that's five colorable but not five choosable? Okay. So maybe this is doable. Uh, the last question is somewhat harder. So this is one result that was on the table that said planar graphs with girth 5. Right? If you forbid 3 cycles and 4 cycles, then it becomes 3 choosable. Right? So Shooting asked, well, with Kai and Wang, if we can extend this result to graphs on the torus. Right? Are graphs on a torus, if you forbid 3 cycles and 4 cycles, are they 3 choosable as well? And there are some partial results that support this conjecture. Right? I think it was, yeah, it was Thomason who proved that graphs on a torus with girth 5 are 3 colorable, but maybe not 3 choosable. And in this same paper, they proved that if you give me a graph on a torus, then they're three choosable if you forbid cycles of length three, four, five. So if you forbid one more cycle, they become three choosable. And the question is, what if you only forbid three and four? And the proof of this statement is eight lines. So it's like fourth of a page. So maybe this is doable. So, so thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs>